Destination Africa brought to you by Standard Bank. So with Africa's economic pulse quickening, there's, as a McKinsey quarterly report put it, new commercial vibrancy and the rate of return on foreign investment is higher in Africa than in any other developing region. So as global executives and investors start to pay heed, we take a look at a bit more of the continent's investment case. And with me in studio to do just that, Admasu Tedese, head of Africa business at DBSA, Norbert Dorr, who's managing partner at McKinsey Sub-Sahara, and joining us from our studios in Nairobi. Kenya, Ali Khan Sachu, CEO of Rich Management. Norbert, we're faced with this growing population, a strong trend in urbanization, a growing labor force, and then a growing middle class African consumer as well. And we've got the fast moving consumer goods sector standing in the spotlight. In fact, a McKinsey report, as Ali Khan said, you know, highlighting that the commodity boom explains only part of the African growth story. So what's your view on the retail space and the consumer segment on the continent right now? Yeah, as, as the report said, uh, the, the commodity story is only a maximum a third of the growth so we have seen over the last 10 years. And the real growth and the real surprise we have seen was actually the rise of the African consumer. We have today, we have 90 million households compared to 50 million 10 years ago who can spend, who earn more than 5,000 US dollars a year. And that means they can spend money beyond just pure survival, so to say. And that's a huge uh, 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 source of growth and there's a huge opportunity for investments. We have seen it in the telecom space because frankly the telecom story is the first story we've seen there with 300 billion mm -hmm. mobile phone users and we see it increasingly in consumer goods but we also see it in financial services, in banking, all the kind of industries which are consumer facing are really will be growing fast and over the next uh, decade of the one trillion additional GDP we'll see half of that in that space so huge opportunities. Uh, and clearly also across the continent, but clearly also concentrated in certain countries. Nigeria with 140 million Absolutely. people having more babies uh, than U Europe has or the US is clearly a space to look at. Absolutely, Ali Khan. It's Nigeria that mm. really springs to mind and provides a nice illustration of the growth story there. Of course, this is exactly what attracted a global retail giant like Walmart to Africa's shores as yeah. well via its tie up with MassMart in South Africa. The scope and potential huge where by 2030, the projection is that Africa's top 18 cities will have a combined spending power of 1.3 trillion dollars. No, I mean the numbers really, once you start looking into the numbers and extrapolating what's going to happen, it's such a compelling story. Um, I have no doubt about that. I think a lot of the problem previously was it had not tipped over the radar screen for anybody other than those people on the ground. And I think that happened with a number of different events. I think the Walmart transaction was transformative for corporate America. I think America had this sort of CNN view of, uh, of Africa, which wasn't helpful. I think Walmart, by putting down that uh, four, $4.8 billion or whatever it was, suddenly focused minds. And I think, you know, we have <coughs> an enormous and very attractive market that a lot of people are beginning to chase. Not only Walmart, I'm mm -hmm. seeing more and more uh, Asian uh, big retailers coming into Kenya. I'm seeing a whole bunch of different players. And it's clear, as we concentrate our people in urban, uh, in urban situations, we've got these young populations which are very aspirational. We have the makings of, of a real consumer-led rally, I think, over the next 10 years. Of course, at Masu, uh, pertaining to the Walmart transaction specifically, we had regulatory issues to contend with coming to bear. Labor got loud about uh, you know, the kind of global muscle Walmart has and the impact it's going to have on local procurement as well. What are the overall challenges of a retail-focused investor setting up shop on the continent? Well, you know, the truth is Africa is a very big place and the, the dynamics change and are very different depending on the places you're in. But I think in South Africa there's been a very specific debate. I don't think I can comment on it other than say that I think the, the shareholders and the regulators have paved the way for Walmart to come in. I think Walmart will bring in new technology, new business processes and, and an ability to, to, to leverage global, global reach. 
in a way that South African retailers have not always managed to do. So I think it will enhance competition. There'll be something in it for the consumer. And, 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 and of course, it will, it will add uh, dynamism to the sector. Of course, we shouldn't take away from the strengthening that we have seen of, as you mentioned earlier, the regulatory and legal systems that are taking place, the increasing openness of uh, trade as well, structural changes that are helping business uh, achieve economies of scale, increase investment, and become more competitive. And it's that East African Common Market Protocol that really stands in the spotlight in that regard. How do you see that opening up that region and investment there? Well, you know, the, the region has really made a strong commitment to integrating, integrating economically first, and economically means in terms of trade, in terms of opening up borders, uh, and allowing cross-border investments to happen, and to rely on one another's infrastructure, so to speak, in terms of the power pool. I think the, the challenge will be to, to, to get some of the, the non-tariff barriers to, to, to get sorted out in the near term, and I think that's been a challenge, but I think infrastructure uh, is, is, is again receiving a big push. Norbert, we had Admaso highlight that ultimately good for the consumer, for the investor, heightened competition? I think in the long term, yes. I think in the short term, perhaps not, but in the long term, I think competition is always good because it makes you fit, it makes you more innovative, and frankly, at the end, the market grows. This is not a constrained market. Mm -hmm. So I think, frankly, the, uh, also uh, the, the, the model we see uh, with Walmart coming in is actually a very smart one to come uh, why bringing global strengths, but also bringing some people who understand the local markets yeah. and Ali bringing a new business model. Absolutely. Ali Khan, I ask this question because being highlighted mm. pertaining to the telecom space that we've touched on already mm. is whether we've seen, uh, you know, the price wars, for example, being triggered as a result of heightened competition in East Africa comes with a sustainable business model to start off with. Is there inherent risk in competition coming to the fore as aggressively as we're seeing? Well, I think you're referring in particular to Bar Sunil Mittal's Bharti Airtel strategy, their price blitzkrieg in the voice market, which has completely turned it upside down. It's cheaper for someone like me to call my brother in Chicago than it is for him to call me. And it's quite extraordinary when you think we're a remote third world country. And w w what it is, is, is it's effectively a much bigger fight. I mean, it's not just about Safaricom and uh, Airtel in Kenya. It's really about Airtel and Vodafone. And they've chosen to fight this proxy war out in Kenya. It's not sustainable right now, but they seem able to throw money at it. Uh, um, the Mumbai, the shareholders in Mumbai haven't yet held Mr. Mittal to account. They're allowing him, I think, to bet on growth, which is a bet that will pull off, I'm sure, at some point. But you quite rightly raised the issue. It's put intolerable pressure on the competition. And in a way, it's unfair. I mean, you know, they're, they're subsidizing it from India. I completely agree with that. But, you know, the other, the other side of it is the mobile segment has been so innovative in Kenya. You know, it's one of the most positive aspects of our economy. The mobile money, Safaricom nearly transferred a billion dollars in December over M-Pesa. It's unbelievable. Uh, that our e-float is, is of such a quantum. And I think what the, the other thing I would draw from, from this discussion is there's so much innovation waiting to be let out of the box across this continent. We just need to enable it. And I'm sure it will outperform yeah. even our greatest expectations. Well, Admar, so of course, when it comes down to it, we've got banking sector growth highly correlated to GDP growth as well. Just this week, we had uh, Standard Bank saying that it's looking to ramp up its business in oil-rich Angola. It's starting operations from scratch on that end. It has no plans to slow down its reach in Nigeria as well. But that bank has a history on the continent already. Just how easy are greenfield investments in the banking sector? Well, actually, the banking sector after the telecom space has been one of the success stories over the past 10 years. We've seen a dramatic growth of uh, not just global banks penetrating Africa, but regional banks emerging apart from Standard Bank. You have Echo Bank. You have uh, quite a few banks within the African space that have reached out and that have established strong networks. The truth is less than one quarter of Africans are banked today. There's a massive opportunity in terms of financial services in Africa. The telecom story is, is, is a specific story in services, but financial services is going to pick up very fast in the years to come. And I think it actually holds more promise going forward than, than telecoms. 
uh, I think I think the the other story to be said about the financial world in the African context is what's been happening in terms of remittances, which has not been raised so far in the discussion today. And I think if you look at where Africa was in 2000 and where they are today, we have about 40 billion US dollars coming into Africa every year. And this is actually helping to drive the retail demand that we're seeing through the urbanization that's been referred to is, is, is very strongly uh, supported by these remittances. Yeah. If you look at aid, official development assistance, that's roughly $30 billion a year. So already remittances are 25% are, are higher than aid, which most people would have never expected at the turn of the century. Foreign direct investment at, the, at its height in 2008 was as high as $87 billion per annum. Again, almost three times the size of ODA. So again, to, 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 to highlight what Norbert said at the beginning, we're no longer really a continent that's driven by aid. We Absolutely. have other massive capital flows coming through. So we've run out of time for today, but a uh, quick verdict. Uh, strides being made in possible, a policy supportive of industry, broad spokes, uh, strokes speaking, hot or not? I would say warm and heating up because the truth is Africa has got a lot of variation in it. Uh, I think if you look at the past three, four years, yeah. doing business in Africa reports have had African, four out of the 10 top performing reformers have been in Africa. So you've got tremendous success in a number of countries, but there's still a great deal to be done. Ali Khan, simply pouring capital in and growing the business alone without additional developmental packages, hot or not? Uh, not. I, I think you've got to look at it more holistically and it's just not about money, it's also about know-how and local knowledge and therefore you really need those, those things around you plus the cash. Norbert, uh, bottom line, Africa as an investment destination, hot or not? Hot if you come with innovative business model and understand the risks. Well, that's where we leave it for this week. Thanks to our guests for joining us this evening. Admasu Tadese, who's head of Africa business at DBSA, Norbert Dorr, managing partner at McKinsey Sub-Sahara, and Ali Khan Sachu, CEO of Rich Management, uh, for all having provided that broad overview of sectors and regions attracting attention on the continent right now.